In today's show, let's take a deeper dive into the science about caffeine and address some common questions as well as misconceptions about caffeine application and its use, particularly addressing things like, does caffeine cause dehydration? Does caffeine enhance fat loss? Does caffeine cause bone mineral density losses and changes in bone structure? What about, is caffeine safe for pregnant women? We're also going to address the myth that delaying the onset of coffee or caffeine consumption by 120 minutes after you wake up in the morning, it might enhance your body body's ability to delay a afternoon crash and possibly improve sleep, which doesn't really have a lot of good scientific evidence. We're also going to address whether or not caffeine improves muscular strength, which I think is particularly interesting because caffeine is one of the most popular ergogenic aids. Many people use this for focus, for concentration, just to wake up and have better morning energy and use this in a pre-workout application. It turns out, and I'll share with you more details later, that caffeine enhances lower body strength more so than upper body strength, which I think is particularly curious. So the title of the narrative review that we're going to talk about today is Common Questions and Misconceptions About Caffeine Supplementation. What does the scientific evidence really show? This was recently published just about a week ago in the Journal of International Society of Sports Nutrition, a very fascinating paper. I will link it in the description below. Now, before we dive into this, friends, I just want to thank our show sponsor, BondCharge.com, the makers of the hottest yet lowest EMF sauna blanket on the market. The sauna blanket is my favorite because it can be used in a very small living space, such as a condo, a flat, or a studio. It gets up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit in just a matter of minutes. Some of the benefits that I've noticed after using the sauna blanket are improvements in sleep, relaxation, sweating, of course. We know that sweating is good to detoxify some of the persistent organic pollutants and microplastics that can be stored in our body. So you can save on this amazing tool by going to bondcharge.com forward slash H-I-H at checkout. Again, that's bondcharge.com forward slash H-I-H at checkout. All the links will be in the description below. So getting back to caffeine. Caffeine is known as 1,3,7-trimethylxanthine and is one of the most widely used substances throughout the world. Caffeine is really readily absorbed. About 99% of it is absorbed between 45 minutes and 120 minutes after ingestion. But it's interesting because the half-life is roughly five hours. Now it varies between 1.5 hours and 9.5 hours depending upon the individual. And that has to do with the cytochrome P450 metabolic system. I believe caffeine is metabolized through cytochrome P451A2 and there's a wide degree of variability there. So some people can readily break down caffeine very quickly. Those are the types that you've had dinner with and they have a cup of coffee after dinner and they can fall right asleep. Other folks like myself, I need to have caffeine only in the morning and no caffeine afternoon uh, before or else I will have sleep issues. So everyone's a little bit different. You can test your genes for this. But how does caffeine work? And this will speak to how caffeine may be uh, beneficial for you as an ergogenic aid. It turns out that mechanistically caffeine binds to adenosine receptors, which in turn blocks the binding of adenosine to its receptor. Adenosine just like melatonin impacts sleep wake cycles and feelings of you know tiredness and being ready for bed and so forth so by blocking adenosine at its receptor level it might improve alertness and as the scientists say this blockage of adenosine receptors indirectly affects the release of neurotransmitters such as norepinephrine dopamine acetylcholine serotonin and glutamate as well as gaba so it turns out that adenosine impacts uh, those various neurotransmitters and GABA, as many of you know, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. There's a lot of benefits to GABA and high GABA release. As a side small note, the ketogenic diet, part of its purported benefits for epilepsy as well as other mental health conditions include increased GABA neurotransmission. So uh, that's, I think, important to recognize. Now, as a result of blocking the adenosine receptor, we have these increase in catecholamines, and this can uh, stimulate the release of stored fatty acids within your fat cells, and it might increase fatty acid oxidation and lipolysis, as well as stimulating our mental acuity and alertness. And this is why many people have caffeine in the morning. But there's a myth on the internet that if you delay the onset of caffeine consumption, you might avoid the caffeine crash. And we're going to talk about that first. This has been a trend that's been promoted on social media. Uh, and this recommendation is delaying caffeine ingestion in the morning from anywhere to 30 to 60 minutes or up to 120 minutes after awakening. The primary rationales are to prevent prolonging the cortisol awakening response peak because adenosine levels are still declining during this time in the morning and to avoid the afternoon crash that some claim happens 
as caffeine is eliminated from the system. However, the validity and utility of these claims are questionable at best, and in some cases not supported at all based upon the available scientific evidence. Caffeine does have the ability to alter the activity of the HPA axis by increasing ACTH, which is uh, adrenocorticotropin hormone. This is the brain-based hormone that will stimulate the adrenals to make cortisol and increase cortisol secretion at rest and during prolonged stress. So with individuals at risk for hypertension, apparently are particularly sensitive to this effect, meaning if you have high blood pressure, taking large amounts of caffeine might actually increase your blood pressure, which I think is, is interesting. So it turns out that about 3.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of caffeine ingestion in the morning resulted in elevated ACTH levels. And so we do know that caffeine can increase cortisol, but we also know that just eating in the morning or at any time increases cortisol, as does exercise. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that you actually want cortisol to be increased in the morning. You wouldn't want it to be increased later in the afternoon and so on. And because there is a wide degree of variability in the peak levels of caffeine between 45 and 120 minutes, I see no issue with people having caffeine first thing in the morning, or maybe not right when you get out of bed, but within 20, 30 minutes, something to that effect. So I think that's probably really important. But the investigators in this narrative review paper say of potential importance is the fact that the elevation in cortisol secretion with caffeine appears to be blunted in habitual users, even if daily intake is relatively low, less than 200 milligrams per day. In those with high chronic intakes, that is 300 to 600 milligrams per day, this cortisol response may be abolished completely. There's also evidence that this increase in cortisol may be limited in the morning hours as, as the same effect has not consistently been seen in the afternoon ingestion, perhaps suggesting a priming effect of the HPA axis during periods where ACTH response may be more sensitive. It is also important to recognize that even with HPA responses to caffeine, there is no evidence that the normal diurnal pattern of cortisol is altered across the day. Additionally, this maintenance of circadian rhythm with caffeine intake also appears to apply to melatonin secretion, which, as you know, is a key regulator of sleep-wake cycles. Like melatonin, adenosine serves as a key regulator of the circadian clock and sleep-wake cycle. The investigators say upon wakening, there is an immediate but gradual buildup of adenosine, while sleep causes a matching, fairly rapid exponential reduction. Changes in adenosine influence wake-sleep transitions as well as sleep intensity. Furthermore, the changes in adenosine in response to increased vigilance upon awakening and in response to stimuli occur in the order of minutes, not hours. I think that's important to acknowledge. There is also a rapid increase in adenosine in transition from sleep to awakening, which then stabilizes across several hours of being active. The inverse response occurs at sleep onset with a rapid reduction in the first couple of hours followed by a plateau. In light of this pattern, any suggestion that adenosine levels are continuing to decline upon wakening demonstrates a lack of understanding of sleep-wake cycle influence on adenosine and would form a poor basis for recommending delaying caffeine intake for 90 to 120 minutes after wakening. In summary, though there may be an upside to delaying morning caffeine intake under certain conditions of sufficient sleep, this has to do with the magnitude of effect rather than proposed mechanisms related to prolonging the cortisol peak, continued declines in adenosine, or avoiding the afternoon crash. A significant drawback in the argument related to cortisol is that similar effects occur with intense resistance exercise performed soon after awakening, also with eating. We know eating is a stressor to the homeostatic maintenance of the body. Cortisol increases after every meal, not to a significant degree, but it still increases. As they talk about, as well as uh, resistance training, we also know high intensity interval training or even going for a run would increase cortisol release. So if you think that having caffeine in the morning is somehow perturbing your uh, circadian rhythms as well as a cortisol awakening response, then you should have equal fear of exercise in the morning, but most people are not concerned about exercise. In my opinion, there's not ample evidence to suggest that you should delay the intake of caffeine. I think it's probably better from a sleep perspective to have, if you're going to drink coffee or have caffeine, have it as early as possible because the half-life can be up to 9.5 hours depending upon the individual's genetics and their cytochrome, cytochrome P450 CYP1A2 enzyme activity. The investigators go on to say, there is also no evidence that caffeine ingestion upon awakening is somehow responsible for an afternoon crash or that delaying consumption would somehow prevent this if it did occur. So there's that. What about the heart? 
in summary, the investigators write, the overall impact of caffeine on individuals' cardiovascular risk profile is likely to be influenced by a myriad of different factors, including dosage, duration of consumption, mode of consumption, whether it's coffee or caffeine pills, and individual metabolic and genetic differences. In addition, much of one's caffeine consumption is via coffee. It is known that regular coffee consumption confers a lot of different health benefits. The current FDA guidelines suggest consuming no more than 400 milligrams per day, especially in one bolus dose. I know a lot of people have those monster energy drinks and several of them while driving or before they party. I think that is probably not a good idea. So clearly the effects of 400 milligrams will differ in based upon one one's body mass, if you weigh 120 pounds versus 200 pounds, and the, the investigators say, moreover, this must be tempered with the fact that many exercising individuals may exceed that dose when caffeine is used as an ergogenic aid. So essentially, it really depends on the dose. If you have a congenital heart issue or high blood pressure, you know, have caffeine earlier in the day and try to have coffee, not caffeine pills, you know, high caffeine uh, stimulants, things like that. Okay, now what about bone mineral density? They uh, did an excellent review to suggest that there is evidence that 400 plus milligrams per day uh, is the threshold regarding changes in bone mineral density. So uh, if you are worried about your bones, just have one or two cups of coffee. Try not to have you know a bunch of coffee in the morning and then pre-workouts and so forth uh, because that might affect future fracture risk as well as bone mineral density, primarily in females, investigators note. They say it is unclear whether any presumed effects is from beverages such as tea, coffee, or energy drinks compared to caffeine alone. Moreover, the lack of randomized controlled trials on this issue makes it difficult to arrive at definitive conclusions Conclusions. Additionally, clinical research, specifically RCTs, is needed to explore the potential dose response relationship between caffeine consumption and bone health. But the take home here is if you're worried about your bones, which I think everyone should be, most of us don't realize that the main reason why people fall when they get older is not because, well, partly because they have weak muscles, but usually, usually the fall results as a from a broken bone. You know, people might twist or turn uh, a certain way, and they have weak bones. And this actually actually happened to my mother. She broke her femur. Uh, in this manner, and as a result, you know, change her diet and lifestyle to further support her bone mineral density, which is fantastic. Um, so, weak bones are not good for longevity. Really important to recognize. But uh, if you're concerned about your bones, then you probably should consume less than 400 milligrams per day. What about pregnancy? Is there concerns regarding caffeine consumption in pregnancy? I think after reading this, I would highly advise pregnant women avoid caffeine consumption. Maybe limit to one cup of coffee per day. But caffeine intake, the investigators say, is consistently linked to adverse pregnancy outcomes. Okay, the cumulative scientific evidence suggests that pregnant women and those considering pregnancy should be advised to abstain from caffeine. And I know that's a hard sell uh, for a lot of people because caffeine is part of their habitual you know, routine in the morning and things like that. But there is good evidence to suggest that you should avoid caffeine, especially high doses if you are pregnant. Now, what about fat loss and weight loss? There's actually, according to this review, no real good evidence that caffeine consumption enhances fat loss or weight loss. It might temporarily increase the liberation of stored fatty acids from your fat cells, but it may not enhance weight loss over the long haul. But it turns out that caffeine may enhance lower body strength. And so this is something that I personally take advantage of as an ergogenic aid, having caffeine before uh, training my lower body. That might include sprints, that might include deadlifts, hip hinges, uh, squats, lunges, things like that. They're very energetically demanding, your legs are, when you train them. Um, but it turns out that there's not really good evidence to suggest that caffeine increases upper body strength, although it might help you feel more excited about you know working out and have a little bit more energy so long as you work out earlier in the day. I definitely do not advise having a lot of caffeine in the afternoon because again, the median half-life is around five hours, but it can be up to nine hours depending upon your genetics. So that's interesting. There also isn't good evidence to suggest that caffeine is inherently dehydrating even during exercise. That was new to me. You know, we do hear that uh, having coffee causes you to be dehydrated, it's bad for your adrenals and these sorts of things, but not really good evidence according to this narrative review suggesting that caffeine inherently dehydrates you. So if people say, well, you shouldn't have coffee in the summer because you're going to be de dehydrated and so forth, uh, really not good evidence there. But there is good evidence to avoid it if you're pregnant. Um, 
not do incredibly high doses of caffeine if you're worried about your heart or have congenital heart issues. And I think the biggest thing here is the half-life of caffeine. It's variable. It can be up to 9.5 hours, and that can perturb your sleep and circadian clock system. And if you like to have caffeine in the morning, there's not really good evidence to suggest that you should delay the ingestion of caffeine or coffee uh, you know, two hours because uh, as we just uh, dove into the adenosine metabolism and so forth, um, adenosine rapidly builds up upon wakening. So that is the review. Hopefully you found this information helpful. If you did, please hit that like button. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road.